to Aficionado. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Bron Smalik. And we're going to be talking about The Legend of Korra, Season 2, Book 2, Spirits. Spirits. Yeah. Episodes 1 and 2, or, or a two-parter of the first episode. Not sure how you count it. Yeah. Um, Beware of spoilers if uh, you have not seen these episodes yet. Yes, yes. Uh, very much spoilers. We're going to go through a little bit of a brief description of what happens in them, and then kind of talk about our impressions of the series so far. Um, let's let's start off with just recapping how season one ended. At the at the end of season one, um, Korra discovered the not, not only the ability to airbend but also soul bending. Yes. So it, it kind of ended, and she got in realized her love for uh, what, what's the Bolin? No, that's the other Mako. brother. Mako. Yeah, she's the brother. <clears throat> the relationship with Mako kind of started off and uh, it was kind of a big deal because she couldn't airbend the whole first season and uh, I think when they made it, they weren't sure if it was going to get picked up for anything, anything more. So it kind of ended with the possibility that this could have been it, but you know, there's more story to tell. Yeah, it had, I really enjoyed uh, book one, and I enjoyed Avatar The Last Airbender, but honestly, the, the whole Korra experience so far has exceeded the expectations that I had, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Um, there are some parts of it that are like, well, especially the first season that felt kind of um, out of place goofy for how realistic everything else had become. Sure. But uh, it kind of grows on you a little bit. Yeah, like a lot of fart jokes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fart jokes. A yeah. lot of fart jokes. I feel like that so far that this, in, with even with these two episodes, I feel like it's it's grown up a lot though. Um, it, it has, and and I think um, they started the characters. So un, unlike other uh, shows where season two, like the first episode, is just reestablishing who everybody is. I felt like they got through that pretty quick and moved pretty quickly into, you know, what I think is going to be one of the major uh, plot arcs for this series. So I like the pacing of it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I, that's one, one of the things I really liked about it, too. It just it jumped right in. It takes place six months after the end of book one, which was called Air. And, uh, yeah. And just a side note. I have to say, the pricing on the DVD was, like, great. It was it was $14 for, for, for book one. Oh, uh, you know, I will admit that I do not own that yet, but I will. That's okay. I don't own, I mean, I have, I have a bootleg copy of The, <laughs> of the Last Airbender, but, have, but those are much more expensive per book. I mean, it's, they're, like, over 20 bucks. Uh, okay. a pop, so $14 it was within my budget range. So I have to say that that was a really cool... I was really pleased with that. So Yeah, and I think the other thing to note, too, I, I don't I don't know uh, how often we'll be able to do this, but this second book, I believe I read it has 14 episodes planned. That sounds about right. Yeah. They're shorter seasons, the Korra books. Yeah, and I think there was uh, 12 in the first book. Yeah, I believe so. And now they have um, they have said that there will be four seasons at this point. Yeah, I, th- so the title, you mentioned that the title of this one is Spirits, which surprised me a little bit because the book one was, uh, wasn't it Air? Yeah. yeah. Book yeah. one was Air, and in the original Avatar The Last Bender, I think each of the four books were, or three books were named after the elements, not, so Spirits is kind of a departure from that pattern. Well, yeah, I think each, yeah, it, it, well, it is um, a departure, but the the way that it went before is, is with The Last Airbender is whatever element he was learning was the title of the book. So right. it started, it, he already knew air, so it started with water. And then it went to um, Earth and then Fire. And because he was a monk, he already had, like, the spiritual stuff down, sort of. So, so then 
I don't know if this is jumping ahead in the conversation, but do you think, so is this season or series or book about spirit bending then? I think it's about the spirit, spiritual side of the Avatar, meaning the, um, meaning the fact that the Avatar is supposed to be the link between the spirit world and the human world. Kind of like how, um, in the last airbender, Aang channeled the fish spirit at the northern water temple and right. attacked the ships or the time with the giant panda that turned into a monster. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, oh, when he went, that great episode where he went and he saw, what was the character's name, Faceless or something? Where if you showed any emotions, it stole your face. Oh, I don't remember that one that well. Yeah, and that w- I would like to know more about that character. And the characters, it was like a giant slug thing, and its face changed, mm. a giant beetle thing. And uh, if you made an emotion, any emotion, it would steal your face. And the thing was, is that it, the last water avatar had a had a girlfriend or wife or something that it had stolen the face of, so it had been the enemy of a previous avatar. Mm, I may have to go back and rewatch. We're going to watch that that first series, actually. Um, So, yeah, I think it's going to be about that, but I do get the sense that there's going to be, that maybe spirit bending is a type of either either an element or some aspect that we haven't really learned much about. And I think I'll I'll, I'll get more into that after, because there's something in the second episode that really... Yeah, hinted at that. So, why don't we go ahead and start off um, with the first episode, Ron? Can you give us a, a bit of a rundown of what we saw there? Well, uh, you mentioned that it was six months after the end of book one, and so Cora uh, is, I guess, an airbender. Uh, I don't know if she's mastered it, but she's learned enough to control it. Um, Mako, uh, we see Mako riding on a, a motorbike, and for a for a split second, you think he might be involved in something shady, but turns out he's actually a policeman. Yeah. And he's up for detective, which is uh, was interesting. And uh, then we, we see Bolin is still doing the pro-bending, and he's got a new team uh, that don't seem to be doing very well. And Asami is, uh, which was Mako's girlfriend uh, in the first in the first series, or for most of it, she's trying to get her father's company, uh, basically trying to keep it afloat, looking for investors or partners. Uh, and Cora is still living with Tenzin and the family at the, uh, uh, at the. I guess they're at one of the air temples. Yeah, I think it's a it's a new air temple at the new city. They call it Air Island or something like that. Yeah, I forget. And, and so that that kind of sets at least sets up where everybody is. You know, I, I didn't um, I didn't notice anything remarkably different about the animation of any of those main characters. Uh, the kid, Tenzin's kids still looked, you know, still looked the same. Uh, so no no surprises there. Yeah, you know, um, one thing to add. I don't know if it'll come into effect later, but in the in the first series, or the first book, um, Asami's father invented airplanes. And so at the beginning of this book, you see Asami is trying to now market the airplanes that he had built. Because uh, he was a villain in the in the previous previous book. Yeah, I, I imagine those are going to come back into play. Now, I'm trying to remember the very last battle in book one did they did they have people coming in on airplanes and yeah. attacking? I think they had bombers, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They had mechs and they had bombers. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. They had mechs. Now, there was there was one thing I had in my notes in this first sequence when you see Mako that I wanted to to ask you about or sure. talk about. So he he's chasing uh, a panel truck. And the back of the truck opens, and there's two men inside. And they're trying to kind of shake him off their tail. Yeah. And one of them, one of them uses water bending, and makes a stream of water go in front of the second guy. And this guy does something, and he turns it into like a mist to try to block Mako's uh, vision. 
and I couldn't tell if he was using firebending or airbending to do that. And the reason that I noted this down is because in Avatar The Last Airbender, like Aang was the only airbender. And I know in book or in book one of Korra, obviously Tenzin and, and uh, there are some airbenders, but does the general population know airbending at this point? No. I think okay. the, the only airbenders that exist are Tenzin and his kids and, and Korra. Okay. Um, okay. So it must have been, he must have used firebending to turn it into steam then. Yeah, or waterbending. I was trying to think, so I watched it twice, because I watched it right before our, we started our discussion, because I was mm-hmm. like, I want to know, I want to be like really fresh on this. And uh, I thought, my initial reaction was like, oh, the one guy was a waterbender and the other guy was a firebender. But then a few seconds later, the same guy who made the steam freezes the water on the ground. So I think they mm-hmm. might both have been water vendors. They were just working together. Okay. Okay. I'm not that this is really, I don't think this is going to be like a, you know, come back and be anything, but it was no. kind of an interesting scene because you got to see Mako kind of as a super cop. Because yeah. I think most of the other cops are, are metal benders, right? Well, that's the impression you got. Oh, that's right. From the first, uh, yeah, from the first book, uh, I forgot, I forgot the main, the chief's name now. Uh, Lynn Bayfong. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And they were like Spider-Man with their metal things shooting out all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, I liked that. I, I liked the fact that the, some of the, um, in, in the last airbender, they kind of discovered a bunch of, uh, subsets of bending. And then in this future, the subsets were kind of almost their own kind of, Bending. Like, the metal benders were really good metal benders, but you really didn't see them using a lot of earth bending. Right, you right. <clears throat> so, so, so after this part, um, basically, Korra and Tenzin and the family, they travel to the south, uh, to the Southern Water Tribe, where there's a festival going on. I forgot the, uh, forgot the name of the festival. Yeah, I can't think of it. Off, uh, like, Festival of the Spirits or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Northern and, or Southern Light Festival. I don't know. Yeah, and I think Tenzin was trying to, uh, you know, combine it with with a trip to the air temples so Korra could, you know, continue learning. Yeah. As well, and uh, the the next the next note that I have in my uh, notes was when we meet Korra's dad. Uh, I I was listening to the voice, and all of a sudden I was like, "Wait a minute, that's Dexter's dad." Yeah. Do you watch Dexter? I don't, but I recognize the voice. Uh, it's uh, James Remmer. Yeah, yeah. I was really surprised, I, happily surprised on that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was uh, very pleased with that. Very pleased with that. So, um, I'm trying to think of what the next big thing was that we saw here. Um, oh. Well, I think we were introduced to uh, her uncle, and and I can't remember if this, uh, if I might be jumping ahead a little bit, uh, but her uncle and her dad obviously have some issues. Uh, yeah. The uncle is, is from the Northern Water Tribe and seems to be like the overall chief, and then her dad seems to be sort of like maybe second in terms of rank. Well, I kind of got the impression that her father wasn't really anything except for maybe a member of the White Lotus clan. Oh, okay. That's the impression I got from the first book, and then kind of continued. But her her uncle is definitely, he's the chief of the Northern Water Tribe. And at this point, we haven't seen anything that denotes any leadership in the South. So I'm not sure if the Northern Water Tribe rules the Southern water, Water Tribe or... Or how exactly that works? Yeah, it seems it seems like there's definitely some overarching leadership by Unalak, which is her uncle. Yeah, and, yeah. And tension with the dad, uh, and I think at this point too, we also is where we also see um, uh, Asami and Bolin are approaching a businessman named Varric. Yeah. Who is the one who drove the big yacht that the chief came on? 
Yes. Uh, there is one thing that I think we're, we skipped over uh, real quickly, kind of a, a monumental thing that introduced some characters, is that we met Aang's other children. Uh, so that's... Um, right. Tenson's brother and sister. Yeah, which is Boomy, and what's the, what is the lady's name? Is it Kaya? I'm pretty sure it's Kaya. Yeah. It, I think so, and I'm not... Uh, yeah, it's Kaya. I'm not sure. I don't think we heard her in book one, but Boomy was was the fire. I believe he was the firebender that was sort of like the general in one of the big battles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a general. He didn't say anything but like scream in the first in the first episode, but uh, yeah, or the first uh, book. Yeah, and and this particular. Uh, these two episodes, he seems to be on Bolin's level, if not even a little bit more, the comic relief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, he definitely acts like kind of like the the character he's named after, which is Ang's friend Fumi. Kind of a little crazy, kind of uh, always kind of joking around about everything, but also you can tell that he's really intelligent with it. Yeah, so I'm not sure how the, how far they're going to play into it, but they they were definitely introduced. I did I did skip over that as as well as Unalak's two children, uh, Eska and I forgot the the uh, boy's name. Is it, uh, I've got it here. It's uh, Desna and Eska, yeah. and they were really creepy, weird. <laughs> yeah, and Eska is voiced by uh, Aubrey Plaza, who is. Um, People would know her from Parks and Recreation. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I think I think one of the three newer, more known uh, cast members this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That she actually has one of my favorite lines from this episode, which was when Bolin is kind of checking out. Uh, checking out the twins, trying to figure out which one's the boy and which one's the girl, and she says. You amuse me. I will make you mine. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. He says, your boyfriend or your slave? And she says, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was classic. Yeah, they've, they've got some... They pull out some pretty interesting bending moves later, but they don't, they don't do much right away other than look mysterious. Yeah. Um, so where we are at the story, uh, Bolin and Asami are about to go approach someone to help them get her father's company uh, back on track. Kind of uh, someone to handle their shipping. And uh, she tells Bolin to kind of keep his mouth shut, but she wants him there for support. And uh, they go in, and the guy is kind of very very eccentric, very uh, full of himself, and everyone in the room seems like really intimidated by his uh, bureaucratic power, I guess it's the right way to say it. He's a powerful man, not like a dangerous powerful man, but like uh, business-wise a powerful man. And uh, Bolin calls him out on some stuff because he, he says that he was levitating and everyone claps and, and celebrates it, but he's like, oh, you didn't look like you were levitating to me at all. And uh, when the guy realizes that everyone was lying to him, he fires someone. Yeah, that was that was pretty funny. Uh, and it's through this that the, the, the guy, I forget his name, Decides he likes Bolin and decides to work with Asami. Uh, I, I think his name is Varric. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's Varric. Uh, and this is, I think, a subplot that we're going to start to see in time. I, I, I don't know. I saw inklings of it. Definitely, this this series more than the last Airbender has more of a more relationships and love in it and stuff. And I, I kind of wonder if Asami and Bolin are going to become an item because. Of the way that they were interacting. Yeah, I I saw a little of it. I actually hope that doesn't happen. I think that would be too too convenient for another relationship so close, you know, to Korra and Mako. Yeah. Um, I do think it would be interesting if Bolin goes with, you know, ends up with Aska, uh, because that reminds me of the, uh, uh, you know, in Aang, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Um, Sako and uh, I forgot the 
the girl that he ends up with, where she's really serious and he's really goofy. And oh yeah, yeah, the Earthbender girl. Yeah, the one yeah. that can touch the cheese spots and immobilize benders and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So she, we're kind of reminded me of that a bit. All right, I could see that. I could see that. I just I, I, when I saw it happen, I was like, I think they might go down this road. Like it would kind of make sense, but you're right, it would be really easy. Yeah, and and by the way, this is like one of the things that I like about this series and the way these the these both of these series have been put together. It's like, I am not a shipper when I watch shows. Like that's usually when I start to tune out on most shows because, you know, over the course of a series, it's going to wax and wane and people are going to get in love triangles and all this stuff. But the way that it's done in, in these series, it feels realistic for people of that age. Yes. Like the decisions they make and the way that they, you know, respond to each other. It just seems very natural, and it it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I was concerned that it would be lame, but it it, it comes across really well. Yeah, really and well. It, and at this point too, I mean, the char- the main characters in this uh, in the Korra series are uh, quite a bit older than those in Aang's series, uh, so it's. I think they're handling them very well. Yeah. Um, so where do we go from here? What happens next? Uh, I don't. I don't remember if there was anything else significant in between, but basically, uh, some angry spirits start to attack. Yeah. And it's this is this is the one thing I'm just a little bit leery of because I feel like. I feel like everything up till now has been, you know, uh, character versus character type conflicts. Yeah. And, like, more pedestrian. And all of a sudden, these, like, random evil spirits or lost spirits are... It just doesn't seem to fit with bending. They're not earth. They're not air, water, fire. They're not human. Right. This sudden sudden thing which just happens to coincide with, you know, uh Cora getting in touch with this side of her personality. So I'm a little bit a little bit leery of how far they go with this. But we'll we'll have to see. Yeah, I'm curious because it, especially in the West Airbender they made it seem like it was more of a big deal when spirits entered our realm. Like it wasn't something they wanted to do. It was like they didn't just cross over. It, it wasn't right. So I think that there's there's got to be like some big bigger overarching thing here. I, I I mean I don't really even in the trailers I was kind of like I don't know, but I, there's so many things about this this series that sells me that I'm kind of okay with it for right now. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, and Cora's Cora's uncle Unalak seems to be perfectly at ease. Like he doesn't. He 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 knows they're coming. He knows exactly how to do some sort of something, and I can only guess that it's it's some sort of spirit bending to take care of the spirits and turn them from angry back to good, and then they sort of dissipate. Yeah, I was trying to figure out if it was a type of water bending or not. The first time he does it, it doesn't look like it, but the second time he does it and Cora attempts it, it looks like water. Spinning, yeah, spinning around them, and I was like, "Well, it would make sense because they can heal with water." I I don't know that this is yeah this is the weird thing because uh, like we said at the end of last season there was a lot of soul bending stuff, being able to give and take away powers, and this seems different, and it seems to have kind of come out of nowhere. Like it's it does it's not one of the Unless it's the fifth element, I don't know. Lilu Dallas Multipass. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be interesting. But I, I, one of the things that the first book did is they really threw in a lot of misdirection with characters. With um, was it Tarnock? Yeah, you, uh, Tar right. Tarlock. You thought that he was like. Hardcore evil. I even, I remember you and I had a discussion, I think, uh, in comments or something where I said I thought Tarlock was the villain, Amon, from the first right. season. Turned out to be his brother. But 
I, I, I thought that it would be a double, a switcher. And I kind of got that feeling with um, Unalak. I, th- I thought, that's his name, right? Unalak? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I thought he was going to, it was it, like, it's like, oh, they're really setting him up to be the bad guy. And I think he will be bad, but I'm not sure that he's going to be the big bad. Yeah, I... And we'll get to we'll get to the revolution in episode two in a second, but I had the exact same feeling like, okay, he somehow is connected to the spirits coming and he's going to basically, you know, use that to force some sort of control over 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 uh most of Tarlock, over uh Cora's uh Cora's father or some he's got some other He's got some other motive at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So this pretty much brings us to the end of the first episode. And at the end of the first episode, after the spirit attacks, uh, Unalak has been pushing for Kor to come and train with him about getting in touch with the spirit world. And she has not done airbending training. And uh, Tenzin wants her to remain with him and visit the air temples which I keep thinking to myself, at the Air Temples is where Aang learned most about the spirit world. Like, that makes the most sense right. of where she should go to learn about the spirit world. But uh, Unalak seems to think that she can't learn it anywhere else, and she, he, she's got to be with him. Yeah, that was. I thought that was a little bit strange. Like, she had such a strong reaction, like, because uh, Tenzin and her father sort of collaborated on forcing her down a certain path and she she gets really upset about that and I just don't know how she jumps to the fact that Unalak is going to have all the answers yeah yeah I think it's just because he was able to stop the spirits and that was it which seems kind of weak to me uh, but anyway she makes this decision she's she's I think she's supposed to be like late teens so it kind of fits the character a little bit yeah um, yeah to be, you know, kind of, when she finds out that she's been lied to, to kind of go the whole other direction. Um, so she decides to train with Unalak, and that's how the, the first, she dismisses Tenzin, and uh, Tenzin leaves with Bumi and Kaya and his family to go visit the air temples. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. and I do, the, the only other thing I had in my notes uh, from this this episode or this part one uh, was another quote and this was by Varric when they are on the ship and he has this basically this supermodel this sort of Marilyn Monroe type person named Ginger and she's you know kind of does her little does her little thing and he's like uh, thanks Ginger go rest your gams <laughs> <laughs> it's the way that he delivered it was so funny I, I had a I had to note that one. Yeah. I a thought lot of... of I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, a lot of good one-liners in this, in this episode, though. I thought that scene acknowledged the adult reality that these characters are in more than anything else. Because <clears throat> not, well, they, they introduce uh, movies and how that's a new invention in their universe. And they show, like, nature stuff. And then his first thing to go to is movies with sex appeal. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's like, that's saying a lot about this universe that they're in. Like, they're willing to acknowledge that as a thing, so. Yeah, it, make, it makes me wonder, you know, how, so so if there are going to be four seasons, like, is technology going to be advancing really quickly? Like, are they going to get to, you know, TVs and more modern day stuff by the end. I'm I'm really curious yeah. because when when they jumped from from uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender to Korra, they jumped what two generations or a generation and a half. Yeah, and the technology just jumped from like you know fantasy times, medieval times to the Roaring Twenties, and I think that's one of my favorite things because I, I don't I don't know that I've seen any other cartoon, let alone really show that's set in the 20s like this. Yeah, yeah, it's, it went from like definite pre-industrial to full-on beginning of the industrial age. Yeah. For sure. So, yeah, I like so, that. 
So do you want to walk us through the start of uh, the second episode? Sure. Season, uh, episode two, what was the name of this one? Uh, is down? it The Southern Lights? Yeah, The yeah, Southern Lights. The Southern Lights. Okay, so, um, you know, it's the way the show works is it kind of just picks up, right, where, where stuff left off. And it starts off with uh, Kara, or Cora, going to talk to Unalak about how she's excited to start training. And already he's got a mission set out for her. He says we're gonna go, we're gonna go on this mission and 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 head out uh, to start to start your training. And this is what I thought was kind of interesting is that he was he must have been super confident he was gonna convince her for what's to come because of the timing was too crazy. So they go to go out on the mission and uh, Bolin and Mako uh, are coming with them as well as the twins, uh, Unalak's kids. And uh, uh, Tonrock wants to come as well, Cora's father. And she's not really having it, but, but he decides to come along. This is something I thought of that was kind of, this kind of odd, is they everyone kind of gets on these camel-like things. Did you catch the name of them? <laughs> I did not, but that's the very first note that I have as well, is camels in the South Pole. And I thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It, I I thought it was awesome, but I was waiting to hear what they were mixed with, or if they were just straight up camels in the South Pole, because everything, all the animals are like polar bear, dog, or seal, penguins, or whatever. Yeah. And, and in the last Airbender, I remember it was a, it was an ongoing joke because they were like, the, the one king had a had a bear, and they were like, I don't understand a bear what a what bear, and they. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't hear what they were called, but I thought that was cool. The next thing that stuck out to me is uh, Tanrak comes out on a on a snow sled or what do they call them? Snowmobile. Yeah. Snowmobile. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. So Tanrak has a snowmobile, and so does uh, Bolin, who borrowed it from that investor guy. But how come the chief of the northern tribe doesn't have one? Mm, like you would yeah. think that if it's an, he's if he has this idea of like timing and stuff, he would be he would have those. I mean, you wouldn't think that money would be as big of an ob- object. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't remember if I'm pretty sure in the past episodes we've seen people on like dog sleds and such, yeah, or or using their bending to just propel them along. Uh, so it was interesting to see kind of the mix of. Again, technology and sort of traditional ways. Yeah. So it's it's on their journey to the North Pole that uh, they discover a secret about Cora's father, and this is kind of the backstory between why he's not between him and his brother, and why he's not chief. So it, right. It, it turns out that he was protecting the northern tribe. And he chased some, I guess, bandits of, of some sort to the North Pole where there was a, a forest hidden, like a, a lush forest where the spirits were supposed to dwell. And he chased them in there, and, and they, the bandits thought they would be safe, but he decides to attack them anyway. And in, in the process, kind of wrecks the, the the sacred forest. Yeah. It was kind of... It, that seemed, um, I don't know, it seemed pretty quick uh, and pretty, like, uh, what do I want to say? Not minor, but it, it felt a little bit thin. Yeah. Uh, and I, were they trying to say that these evil spirits are somehow connected to that event, or this is a completely new set of evil spirits? Well, I think that the spirits that attack the northern... Uh, tribe after that were connected with that forest and because he wrecked it they got angry and then acted out Mm -hmm. and now I guess they were implying that the spirits in the southern part sensed uh, Tanrak there and were angry Mm -hmm. as they were journeying towards another epicenter of spiritual connection of some sort like basically they were going to a forest in, at the nor- at the southern pole, yeah, they were heading towards like a giant storm, like a never ending storm. Yeah, and and then actually, basically, she tells her father to leave and not 
go with them. Right. She's getting angry because he's kept stuff from her. Yeah, which I I don't know. It doesn't seem like that. Like he, I I wouldn't get the idea that he would hide that from her specifically for any reason other than like just something he doesn't bring up to anybody. You know, right. like embarrassed that he let himself get out of control and destroy this this thing. Right. It didn't seem like it was anything personal to her. And then again, she kind of seems like she again kind of overreacted, but she was already ticked off at, you know, some of the reveals from the other yeah. episode. Well, it's no secret that he's the brother of the chief because they sit at the high table together. But I think it was kind of a secret that, not a secret, but not really known that he was the one who was supposed to, he was the first in line. Yeah. And as a result of his actions, he was uh, banished from the northern tribe and went to the southern tribe to yeah. start a new life. Now, now this is something that I that I put in my notes. I felt like in both of these episodes, and it's probably been building up over the last series too, but there is a lot of emphasis on siblings. Basically, everybody in the series other than Korra... Uh, has siblings. So there's there's Mako and Bolin, Tenzin and his brothers and sisters, Tenzin kids, Chief Unalak and Korra's dad, uh, Unalak's got twins. It seems like everybody that we see uh, has siblings, and they are important to the plot. Yeah, except for Asami, at least not that we know of yet. Oh, true, true. Uh, so... Uh, and I'm, I was thinking back through other shows that I watch, uh, not cartoons, but just like, uh, you know, Walking Dead and and a lot of the other shows that I've been watching. Which it just doesn't seem like everybody has a brother and sister. Like, there's a lot more people who are, you know, maybe not only child, but their siblings aren't stressed as much. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's just the writing style that everybody everybody is close with their sibling. I don't know. Something about it stuck out to me as I was watching this episode. I kind of feel like it's to make you realize how at some point we're going to deal with, Cora is going to deal with being alone. Mm -hmm. And but like usually, you know, usually if you see a group of like a fellowship of people thrown together, yeah, they're not actually related. Like there may be True. one or two that are related, but everyone in this, series ha is related to somebody which just kind of kind of interesting to me I don't know. yeah well at this point i think we take a break from the story of cora and we we, we visit tenzin arriving at, at the air temple his father's home and uh this is something that struck me as interesting they arrive and there are air mo monks there now not people who have airbending power but people who just want to live like airbenders. Right. Like it, and they were pretty much in awe. Like, they were so happy that they were coming to visit, too. Right. This is a concept that was introduced in the first book, that there were, there were they called them acolytes, I think, that there were people who were choosing to live like the air, the air tribe, even though they weren't from the air tribe. And I thought to myself, that is a really interesting concept of people who would be willing to leave such strong culture of whatever tribe they're in for another and join another tribe and like live and change their family into this kind of kind of tribe because you know that their kids wouldn't be airbenders they would just they would be whatever from whatever tribe they were from right but they would raise them in, in that culture so I thought that that was really interesting when they introduced it in the first book, and then I thought it was even more interesting to see how they were acting with Tenzin and that they're basically, like, super fan fans of, in that, like, uh, well, not worship, but, like, in total awe of airbending. Right, right. And actually, at this point, too, we see the return of, or we see another one of those little flying, uh, flying monkey things. <laughs> I forgot what the... Uh a, a lemur. Yes, yeah. yes. Flying lemur, yeah. And we're also reintroduced to the, the Hall of Statues, showing all the a past avatars uh, 
and Aang is now the last one that's been placed. Yeah, I I thought it was was interesting, and and definitely what happens you know near the end is Tenzin's older daughter is kind of really intrigued by the statues, so there's something else is going to be important about them that we haven't quite seen yet. Yeah, I, I'm curious. This this whole spirit world thing is kind of interesting to me because in the trailers, and I know that you avoided them for spoilers, and I don't, I don't think that there was much to be spoiled in them except for that you knew that... Uh, what's the old, eldest daughter's name? Janora, I think. Yeah, okay, maybe it's, it might be Janora, yeah. Well, she apparently... It looked like she was uh, guiding... Korra through spirit world stuff. Hmm. I think that she might have some sort of connection, whether because she's the granddaughter of an avatar, or or maybe she gets um, like soul bended to have the ability, or something like that. I think something like that's going to happen. And she's her. an air she's an airbender, right? She's an airbender. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Also, in this time, it seems like something's following her or something. She has this kind of, like, moment where her her eyes dilate, and then she thinks something's behind her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and she doesn't, like, the scene just kind of ends there. So, I think what was going to happen here, interesting. Um, but, uh, so moving on, we go back and we learn that the, that the aurora borealis in this reality is caused by the spirits in the north, and that the south had an aurora borealis as well, but uh, the south pole's connection with the spirit world is blocked, and Korra needs to open it. Yeah, she needs to open up. I, I wasn't sure if she was opening a portal. I think it was so that the spirits could get back to some place. Like, they come once a year, or once yeah. every so many years, and they could get back, maybe? Something like that. They didn't quite explain it. I think, I mean, I'm sure they'll probably go into it more, but it seemed like it was a doorway. And without the Avatar's help, and without the, the whole festival was supposed to be like a time to connect with the spirits and keep this doorway healthy. And because they had commercialized it, uh, the doorway had kind of frozen over. And it wasn't open anymore. And so I don't know if the spirits were stuck here, or they were just angry about that, or... They didn't quite explain it, so Korra has to go into a similar forest to what you saw in the north, except for this one's all frozen over because it's been not uh, working properly. And in here she fights some more spirits, to which, I don't know, I was kind of like, ah, it's kind of cool action, but at the same time it's, I don't really, fighting the spirits just kind of, doesn't do it for me. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, like I said, I like the more, you know, person-to-person antagonist. This spirit stuff, I don't know what the rules of them are yet or how you defeat them, so it's it almost feels like too big for the plot. Right. Another thing we didn't, that I took note of that was in uh, book one as well as now book two, or I'm sorry, um, the first episode as well as the second episode is Korra switches in and out of the uh, Avatar state with uh, wa- uh, like a lot of disregard, and and something that was was kind of like pounded into Aang was that the Avatar space uh, the Avatar state should be used sparingly because if you die in it, then there's no more Avatars. You don't get reincarnated. Oh, I f- don't remember that. That's yeah, interesting. But the line will be broken if you die while you're in the Avatar state. And she's using it to win races, all these little things, to get all these like tiny boosts. Or Aang really used it like at the last moment. If he really couldn't defeat a, a bad guy, he would use it. And for those who aren't familiar with the Avatar state or don't remember it, the Avatar state is uh, the eyes glow, and if they have tattoos, the tattoos glow, and and the Avatar channels all the memories and experience of past Avatars, so they're able to control everything at super expert uh, levels and have like the ideas from previous Avatars and think 
uh, well, they're not invincible by any means, but uh, it's like the, it's their strongest point, and it's also their weakest. Yeah. Well, if they die. Well, and and not only the Avastar state, but I think you mentioned it in the first episode, but it definitely in this one too. It's like Cora suddenly is emulating her uncle and able to do this, or almost do this spirit. Uh, calming thing where she kind of does like a, a form, like a martial arts form, and then suddenly the power, you know, starts to turn the spirits from evil to good. And I was like, well, wait, when did she learn that? How, like, what, what are they doing? Have they ever taught her that before? Like, how did it, like, where did this come from? My impression was that she saw it and she was trying to emulate it but couldn't do it. And uh, I, that's why I kind of thought maybe this is water bending and has to do with healing, and they're kind of like healing the bitterness out of the spirits or something like that, and that's how it's working. Uh, because yeah. it almost starts to work, and then the spirits like now and attacks her. Uh, so I, I, I'm curious about that. I'm sure we're going to find out more, more about it. Yeah, and I, I bet you it's not as it's not as much of a good thing as it seems. I kind of wonder, I was like, I wonder if he is absorbing the spirit somehow or killing it because they kind of just fade away into pixels after yeah. that. Well, I, f- I feel like they ca- basically calm down and go, you know, return to wherever they they came from, like he's calming the angry beast sort of thing. Yeah. But, but yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely something more like... It seems like this type of a plot mechanic would should be like over more than just one and you know one and a half or two episodes. So I, I'm sure there will be more explained. But uh, yeah, yeah. Ba- basically, she and you you'd watched it more recently, uh, the, your second time than I have. I watched it uh, the Friday, so basically a week ago, and. Uh, she basically just kind of walks in and opens the portal and everything clears up, isn't it? Yeah, well, she gets attacked by spirits, and so she she's trying to open the portal with other bending, and she can't get it. It's, it's, like, it's like an ice floor, and underneath is this giant glowing orb. And she's trying to break down to it, and she can't break down to it. And then she gets attacked by the other spirits, and uh, she goes into the avatar state, and she just, with a finger touches the floor above the orb, and the orb opens up and shoots a beam into the sky, and there's an aurora borealis type effect yeah. above the north, and everyone kind of celebrates. Uh, and she walks out. The other interesting thing that happens during this is... Uh, um, man, I wish I could remember that girl's name. The, the eldest, Tenzin's eldest daughter remembers or it doesn't remember, she senses something, she gets up and she walks into the, the hall of statues. And she's walking through the hall of statues and she gets to one and she's like, what who, What avatar is this? And it appears to be a lady that has things swirling around her just like uh, the stuff that swirls around the spirits mm-hmm. and uh, some sort of banner behind her. Something that I noticed is she also only has... She doesn't have full arms. Right. It looked like her statue was much made of much older wood, and it was sort of, you know, worn away over time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, You know, I didn't even recognize, I wonder if I can find a screen cap, uh, but I didn't recognize, the, like you said, the swirls around her. I was thinking she was kind of wrapped in, like, tree branches or something. Well, I mean, it's... it's um wood that's swirled around her, but it's in the, and it has, like, writing on it, but it's the same kind of, like, DNA swirl that uh, goes around the spirits when they calm them. Okay. And uh, so when Korra, when, when the Avatar goes into the Avatar state, um, all the statues, their eyes all glow, uh, and it kind of, like, goes from the first one down to the newest one as the Avatar goes into the Avatar state. That's something they established in The Last Airbender. I don't know if there's any significance to it or not. It's just something that kind of happens. Mm-hmm. You, you can see when the avatar goes in. So she's standing at this at this statue. That again, I'm go- I think it's going to be uh, something interesting when we find out about this character that she because it doesn't only she has arms, and I bet she develops some sort of bending 
because she doesn't have arms or something. That's I don't know. I could totally be wrong. Maybe the arms are just worn down. It just looks funny. But no, you're right. They're definitely they're definitely they were definitely missing. But I got the impression, yeah, that it was the statue was just really old. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, so with this statue, not only does the eyes light up, but the swirls around the statue light up and the banner behind it. So the statue has something to do with the spiritual connection. Another thought that I had when seeing this is that perhaps there was at one point a spirit tribe. And you know how the um, airbenders were almost eliminated? Mm -hmm. I wonder if there was a spirit tribe and that people have just forgotten about it. And this was an avatar that was born into the spirit tribe Mm. or something like that. So I could totally be wrong, but yeah, I just, I just actually have the episode up while you're, we're talking. I can definitely see the swirls now as well. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting Statue. I, I, like of all the things that happened in this episode, this is the thing I'm most curious about. Mm-hmm. Who, who is this? What's going on here? That kind of, what's the connection with Tenzin's oldest daughter? That kind of thing. Like I, I kind of wonder is like is there a residual effect in the children of an avatar? Do they have like special abilities because of that? Um, so the the so we're getting towards the end of this episode, and, and what happens is. Uh, they kind of return back to the, the Southern Water Tribe, and as they get there, fleets of ships are coming in for the Northern Tribe. And, yeah. Yeah, and this is where uh, Unalak reveals that the education of spirituality for the Southern Tribe is just beginning. Yeah, I mean, it basically looks like an occupying force, and it, it totally reminds me of the fire uh the fire nation ships coming in you know during during the ang series yeah yeah so i wonder he so emphasizes the the spirit realm i think to myself man maybe he is going to like maybe he wants to control spirits he doesn't want to just calm them so maybe he's he's intending to attack via the portals or something or yeah, I mean, I think clearly, well, maybe this is the easy way out, but, you know, using using this uh, lack of spirituality in the South as a, uh, you know, as a political move to take over and just gain more power. That could be too. I, I don't, uh, we don't, we don't really see enough yet to see if he's going to try to expand beyond the, uh, beyond the, the water, like if he tries to oh, you know, the rest of the world is corrupt and now we're going to go take over Republic City as well and, like, you know, sort of a Hitler yeah. kind of situation starting to be set up. Yeah. But uh, I definitely wasn't expecting a water, basically a water tribe army to come in. and Right. So. Another thing to note is six months after the first book, there's almost no residual effect of the anti-bending propaganda. Yeah, I, that we saw. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they'll, uh, if they'll bring it up again. Yeah, Be so interesting. That's, that's pretty much dead, I guess. Now, now my favorite quote from this episode <laughs> was was from Bolin, and uh, this is where he's he's got this special winter suit that has all these uh, James Bond sort of gadgets in it. And at, at one point, he gets completely inflated, and he's, like, sliding down a hill, and then I think he, like, lands in the water or something, and he's floating, and he yells out, like, I'm a raft. <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. So so overall, I mean, we've only seen two episodes, but from a, from the perspective of, you know, the season opener... Do you think does this hold up, or were you overall impressed? Or I'm, I was very impressed. I felt like uh, not only was it living up to the previous season, but it has the feeling of going, is of becoming like continuing to grow, yeah, and, and be better. 
So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I would say that I am more interested in all of the side characters than Korra at the moment. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm more interested in this invading fleet than the invading spirits. Um, but I, I have a good feeling about the rest of this, uh, this book. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Um, I definitely am more interested in other things than I am in Korra in general, but I think that that's something that's different than the first book was kind of like, I didn't care so much about the other people as much as I did Korra, and this one's more focused on everyone else. Yeah, so. yeah. Now, I, and then I have one, one other question for you. I don't know if you and Elaine talked about this in the past or we talked about it, but if you, if you had one of the bending powers, you know, air, water, earth, fire, which one would you want? <laughs> I remember you did ask this one, and I can't remember what I said, but <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could remember. Uh, what? Because you have to think of your personality, right? Because that kind of fits you where you where you belong. And I don't know. I don't know. Like. I, when I was rewatching it today, I was thinking that too, and I was like, "Would I be an Airbender?" And I, I was like, uh, "I don't. I feel like I would either be an Earthbender or an Airbender." Okay. And, and I know that they're actually supposed to be like the most opposite of each other. So, hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I I look at the Waterbenders and I'm like, "Oh, I could not live in that cold <laughs> all the time." Oh, true. Yeah. See, I, I like the idea of waterbender because presumably you could like go underwater and swim and like hold your breath and all that stuff. Um, but it might, I might be air, I think, yeah. or at least I would want to be air because they just, I love all of their, uh, their speed and their ability to kind of zoom around and fly around on stuff and, yeah, blow stuff out of the way seems like a lot of fun. Although I might be, I might be a waterbender in the like the swamp waterbenders. Okay, <laughs> with the plant control. Yeah, because I'm a horticulturalist, so. I oh, could, that's right. I could see myself being in the, in the like the the waterbenders with the plants. Yeah. So. I wonder. I wonder which uh, benders probably Earth would be most attuned to like computers. So I guess it would be maybe fire because of the lightning sub and earth because of the metal sub uh, powers. Yeah. It's something like technology or inventions seems yeah. like earth to me. So I don't know. Yeah. I, we should we should look up and see if there's a place to take a test. Oh, I'm certain that there is. <laughs> like, like a legit, I mean, because I, I don't know about you, Ron, but I got officially uh, sorted into a house. Oh really? For, at Pottermore dot com. So I don't think I've ever done that, but I will. I'll have to do that, and maybe, maybe next after next week's episode, we could compare official bending uh, predictions. Okay, I like that. We'll have to do that for next time. All right. Well, and everyone, if you enjoyed this, please uh, leave a comment and just let us know what you thought about the two episodes and of course your predictions for the future and if uh, we see anything kind of that we hadn't thought about or or uh, any some, some maybe some new points that we didn't cover we'll talk about them next time yeah definitely tell us what you what you like about the show what you uh, what your as David said what your theories are and uh, that was that was good uh it's a good time. I look forward to the rest of the season. Yeah, me too. And so we don't know when we'll do this again. We're just going to do them when we have time. So, uh, you know, there might be episodes where we talk about just one episode, and then there might be episodes where we have to catch up. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, we look forward to talking with everyone again next time. That's right. See Cheers. Cheers.
Tonrock is her uncle, right? I oh, think no. Unalak. Yeah, uh, Unalak is the uncle. Yeah. Which okay. both of those make me think of Ziploc for some reason. 